Daniel Humsey here, Director of the Neighborhood Empowerment Network, and today here at San Francisco City Hall, we're hosting the 2018 Bay Area Regional Community Resilience Summit. It's an amazing network of organizations that have come together to go deep on the issue of how can we build equity into all of our resilience planning and make sure that all residents are able to be part, not only of the response phase, but a part of the recovery phase as well. One of the sessions that we uh, had an honor of hosting today was a complete breakdown on the Empowered Communities Program, which was funded by M Microsoft and the Walter and Lise Haas Fund. And now join our presentation and see how we are advancing equity in our work here in San Francisco. And we're gonna take a minute and actually basically bring you up to speed on the work we've been doing here in the city for the last 10 years. Uh, the truth is many people in this room have seen this presentation, so uh, either A, take great pride because you helped develop the system, or just smile because you know I'm sensitive and it make me feel bad if you appeared bored any moment during my presentation, right? So, but we're really excited about the work we're doing and we want to just take a minute and share that with you. And so I'm gonna basically jump in really quickly and, and talk about the reality of this work. So, um, I do want to recognize that uh, there are two individuals that really gave us the runway uh, to do this work. Uh, this program originated uh, with the direction of uh, Gavin Newsom when he was mayor of the city and county of San Francisco. And those of you who may not know it, uh, mayor New Lieutenant Governor Newsom is actually incredibly passionate about this work. In fact, he was going to come today, but he had to attend a CSU meeting in the Southland because as uh, our friend Scott Mauve pointed out, he feels that the connection of social connection, civic engagement, and disaster preparedness are all connected. And so for him, this is a very big priority for him, given he was the mayor of San Francisco and now working at the leadership level in the state. The other individuals, and that's the one that really gave me the opportunity to focus on this full time, uh, was the late Mayor Ed Lee. And uh, I know a lot of people have heard a lot about Mayor Lee's, you know, priorities and focuses. And what people don't know is that when he was city administrator before he became mayor, this was priority one. And why was that? Well, the truth is, is that Mayor Lee and I ended up going to New Orleans uh, post-Katrina and actually were charged with helping the Broadmoor neighborhood rebuild after Katrina. And so as you may recall, you know, when you look at what happens in a disaster is when you remove the water the outcomes look all very similar. You see a home here in the Ninth Ward that was blown off its foundation, uh, and then you see a home on Knob Hill that was burned to ground after the fire. Um, let's do forget, most of the fires in San Francisco post-earthquake were either set by the army or by people trying to cook breakfast, right? So how many people think we should use candles after disaster in our home? Oh, I love that. That's the best answer I've gotten all day. Um, but then, you know, there's this important image you have right here of this house and car. Now, being from San Francisco, immediately I think it's a Burning Man art piece. And, you know, house and car wrestle, house wins, right? The truth is, is that this is in the middle of the Ninth Ward. And I want you to think about the wave energy and water energy it takes to move two assets like that and stack them up. Right? I mean, we're all, when we were kids in the bathtubs with our boats, we'd spin everything around and create chaos, Right? The truth is, is that I want you also to remember, though, that when the earth, as a hurricane approach, the city declared that people had to self-evacuate to get out of harm's way. Now, they knew the levee system protecting many of the vulnerable neighborhoods had been under-engineered and needed to be replaced. But what they didn't think about was how much money does the poorest neighborhood in one of the poorest cities in America have in their back pocket on the last day of the month? Right? because their social security checks hadn't arrived yet. So the truth is, is what they were basically saying to hundreds of residents, we hope you can swim. And one of my colleagues isn't here today, Felicia Thibodeau, who runs the Bayview program, but her grandmother actually was lost in the, water, in the flood event in the Ninth Ward. And when you look back, you realize that just a few blocks away, there was a parking lot full of school buses that were left behind to drown. And you're saying to yourself, wait a minute, didn't anyone connect the dots? Like, self-evacuation for the economically disenfranchised is not really an option. The levees are going to fail in the neighborhoods they live in because they've been under-engineered. And we have tons of school buses sitting around that we can, you know, take over and use to get people out of harm's way. So in the end, even though only two inches of water fell in New Orleans that day, what we saw was one of the greatest social justice tragedies ever in the history of our country. And what I also feel for those of us in the room, 
that are on the government side of this business is, is that we lost credibility at that moment. And we've been working, I think, aggressively, in many cases successfully, to restore that credibility. But in the end, if we can't be there for when people need us the most, then we need to be there beforehand to empower them to be their hero in case we can't do it for them. And so that's really what I think the lesson is of this, and that's what drives our work today. And that's why Mary Lee came back and said we need to do a lot more. Now, amongst all that carnage, we found something beautiful. So this is the uh, Broadmoor team that was assembled to rebuild their neighborhood. Um, you see Hal Rourke and Latoya Cantrell at the front by the, the display board. And then you also see Mayor Lee with his back and members of our planning team. And we supported and worked with them to help them implement their recovery plan because they didn't really believe they could trust their government to do it. Now what's exciting about that picture is you see Latoya Cantrell in that picture? Well, Latoya went on after her work as a community advocate and became elected city councilwoman for her district. How great is that? You know what's even greater is, as of last week, she is the first woman mayor of New Orleans. And she sat on this stage two years ago at the same summit and told everybody in this room, do not wait for the Calvary. You're the Calvary. So there's a lot of lessons in that. And one, of course, is this, is that out of disasters can come beautiful, great things but let's just make sure everyone's left is back at the table to celebrate those beautiful and great things, right? So we, she went on to do this incredible work. Now, what we did is, if you look at this picture, is you see the Broadmoor neighborhood. You see the school with the red brick roof. That building was destroyed in the hurricane. We actually helped them write a grant to rebuild it. It is the first certified LEED Platinum school in uh, Louisiana history. Um, and it was built because of grants that we helped them secure by having our contractors that write grants to us all the time for building projects in San Francisco provide them free technical aid. You see to the north, you see the, the buildings, there's a library and a, a community clinic. We actually um, helped secure free Wi-Fi technology and computers um, to actually line the entire corridor so when children left the school, they'd have free Wi-Fi all the way to the library and to the community center to do homework. So it was an example of how this city helped another city rebuild, but we did it at the neighborhood level. And I just want to say that, you know, Mayor Lee has a lot of incredible legacies, but for 475 children every day, that's the living evidence of his commitment to this work. And I just want to honor him because, as you know, we lost him um, tragically um, earlier, or later in the past this last year. And um, it was a big loss for us in the building. And uh, I just want to take a minute and acknowledge his work. So if you just would acknowledge that, I appreciate that very much. So let's talk about uh, the program that just aided out of this. So we call it the Empowered Communities Program. Why is that? Well, because frankly, in looking at all the science, and Kristen Hogan actually did a lot of this research, is that people get that they have to get prepared for disasters, but it isn't always the best thing to put on the menu, if you know what I mean. But what people are interested in is empowerment. And so that's why we led with this empowerment narrative, because people are like, I don't want to be considered a victim. I want to be considered someone who's in control of my scenario. And that's what we said empowerment builds, right? So with that, we have the, the NEN universe, right? So this is one thing that I think we learned, and Trevor and, and the folks in the Red Cross and I talk about this all the time, is no one agency or organization is going to save the neighborhood or save the city, right? Every, origin, every agency in every municipality needs to take on resilience as its mission, right, in some way, shape, or form, right? So in our network, we have, of course, our government partners, right? So you see all the amazing city agencies that are partners in this work. We also have an amazing collection of nonprofit partners and from the faith community, the, the public safety community, the Red Cross, et cetera, et cetera. We also have this great network of private sector partners that are really, really helping us every day to succeed in this work. And then lastly, we have this amazing academic network that we work with. And to be very clear, if your city has a university or a community college or a, a, a UC, et cetera, et cetera, that should be a key asset in your partner in this work because universities care about community, especially community development, and care about health. And if you're not coordinating with the health students that have to do 200 hours of service in the communities, if you're not working with the GIS department that want to learn asset mapping, you're leaving millions of dollars on the table in your municipality, 
right? And so here in San Francisco, we work with UCSF, San Francisco State, and now we're launching a big partnership with USF. But we just wrapped up a huge partnership with Stanford's Design School on a project called the Strong Home Program. And the first thing we decided was, after disaster, you may not go to Golden Gate Park, but you don't want to be indoors. So if you live in a single family dwelling home, where will you go? Your backyard. But how do you set up your backyard to shelter in it for three weeks after disaster? The proverbial question is, what do you do with the poo, right? And so the bottom line is, is that Stanford hosted a bunch of charrettes with uh, thought leaders in the resilience uh, sustainability movement to design a program that we hope to roll out this year. So again, the students did all the work. We just filled the room with the, um, the con constituents. They facilitated the process and their class project was to write the report. Net cost to me about 10 hours of staff time. Right? So just to put out there, like, don't look beyond um, these assets for you to work with. Um, now, the, neighbor, the Empower Communities Program. So our approach, and this is kind of like what we were talking about today earlier, which is we um, plan with people, not for them. Right? And this is uh, admittedly a big component of our program that people look at and try and wrap their brain around. But when we see a vulnerable community like the Bayview or the OMI, neighborhoods that we know have huge risk issues, but also incredibly vulnerable populations, we'll go into that neighborhood with our collective impact approach and we'll spend three years in that community helping them create a resilient action plan and implementing it. And many of the community members that um, are working with us right here in the room today, could, could our community leads from our neighborhoods that we work here in the city raise your hand so we acknowledge your work? Glenn, GL, Mark, Joni. John, we're, we're, we're going to get to you, but you're working in my neighborhood, right? So, so the bottom line is we've got some great um, neighborhood leaders that are, are donating literally thousands of hours of their time to help implement this program. So that's another amazing resource. I mean, I learn more from Joni Van Rin every week doing the work we're doing in San Francisco, in, in Mira Loma Park, because she's applying her expertise in organizational development and management and team building. And now I think she's created some of the most exciting trainings I've ever seen implemented um, within the NERT space, um, when she is the NERT lead in our community. Behind her is her husband, Guido Van Rin. He and I are knocking out this new program with Robert G next to him, something called the Block Champion Program. If they weren't you know, driving this and Guido putting in 10 hours a week, um, making this program happen, it wouldn't happen. So look beyond also the professionals and look at the people that are the retired professionals and realize, you know, we have one of the most educated populaces in the country here, many of whom are people that want to continue to contribute after they retire. Guess what? Give them something to work on, right? So again, mine these neighborhoods for these brilliant... Oh, there's Betsy Eddy over here at Diamond Heights. Oh, and there's Greg... And there, of course, is Jill Barovka in Diamond Heights. Again, Betsy coming out of the city, doing emergency management planning in the city, and now applying that in her neighborhood, right? So, again, remember, the neighborhoods know more about their risks are, what their needs are, and often have the ability to contribute to that mission better than anybody you can hire. Um, with that, then we also say we actually design with people as well. So every system that we share with you right now was designed iteratively and reflectively with our neighborhood leaders. Right? So to be very clear, we didn't have the budget to go hire a big consulting firm to come in and drop a binder on our desk and say, here's your, here's your million dollars worth of brilliance, you know, now go to work. We actually went out in neighborhoods, built the systems with them, and you know what we found out? Is that when they help build something, what do they do? They help implement it, right? So, and when people have a question like, well, where did this come from? So when we went to the Fruitvale neighborhood and, and talked to West Oakland as well, and they said, well, why should we listen to San Francisco? I'm like, well, don't listen to San Francisco. Listen to G.L. Hodge and Felicia Thibodeau from the Bayview and find out why they want to do this work. And because the people in West Oakland feel a similar social economic justice issue as the people from the Bayview, they were like, oh, well, if the Bayview built this, then maybe we should take a look at it. So it's also a powerful way to help people to onboard the system because they see their peers are involved. So we want to make sure things are scalable, duplicatable, and sustainable. We can't build systems that work in only one neighborhood. They need to work in all neighborhoods. And we also want to make sure that there's benefit for every stakeholder organization um, in the program. So, and most importantly, we want to basically make a point of uh, onboarding communities and building their resilience through the transfer of power, right? And I think we've all been talking about this today. If you have a vulnerable resident who's living in their home that has some kind of chronic condition, ultimately, their ability to survive a disaster should reside with them. Because if they do the pre-work 
and make sure they have the resources they need and, and just need technical support um, and expertise and, and from their neighbors, then they're probably going to make it. But if we don't actually empower every resident to be able to have the opportunity to make that plan, then the truth is, is that when we show up afterwards, it's probably going to be a very difficult lift. So we want to transfer the power back to everybody um, in order to achieve that goal. Um, now we're in the Bayview. And GL, you want to come over and take a quick second and just uh, talk about this portion of it? Uh, GL Hodge was our founding partner in the Resilient Bayview Initiative. So you can stay down there because you can see the slides, but it's the ones we did um, from the... How you doing this morning? It's so great to see so many faces from so many different areas. But the main thing that we were here to talk about is ground up resiliency. You can't do it without us. You can't do it for us. We have to do it. And if you don't do it, we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> Welcome to the baby. If you see here, here's our shipyard, one of the most polluted places that you could ever come to. But during this time, it was a bustle of the Bay Area. We had a lot of things going on there. The shipyard was building ships and at the same time polluting the area. And people came from all around, people from the south, people from the east, especially black people, came to get jobs, came for a new, new, a new world, a world that we wasn't depressed in, a world that we were dealing with Jim Crow laws. This is what it was all about. We came to San Francisco to change our lives and make a better life for our kids. You see these areas here. These are the areas where we live that, but you can also see Bayview residents demand rights because we found out that we had a natural occurring asbestos area that we were staying in. The shipyards moved out and the, the pollution that was left there to those areas, our kids and stuff was dying of asthma, dying of different disease. They were trying to make a better way. You can see we started protesting on that. We even had a power plant down there that PG&E was there that was polluting our area, but we made a change. Look at the future now. We got construction going on down there. The community stood up and said we wasn't going to have it anymore. We're not going to let you tell us what to do. We want to make sure that our areas are cleaned up to residential standards. We want to make sure that you, when these hazardous trucks was going in and out of our areas, cleaning up the area, that they were covered. They wasn't just taking the waste and blowing it in the air and everything. But the community stopped this. Without the community, you couldn't do it. And now you see affordable housing in these areas down there and local hire, which was implemented in San Francisco, uh, that you had to hire people in the community in order to do the work in the community. And then had a standard set for how many percentage of the people that was going to work on the project. I believe it was 40%. Our neighborhood, ready for anything, Resilient Bayview. Resilient Bayview is a group of nonprofit organizations, faith-based organizations, city organizations that came together, and we had to stand up and listen to Daniel talk for about 30 minutes without even taking a break. But uh, that's another story. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> but once he quit talking, he started listening. He started to understand, how can I talk about disaster preparedness when I have kids getting shot every day on the street? How can I talk about disaster preparedness when I can't even eat or feed my kids? How can I talk about disaster preparedness when we have shootings in schools? So the thing is about resiliency and resiliency in your neighborhoods, it's about what's important to you. Get behind something that means something to you and then take those leaders that's in those communities and empower them. Take your monies and not put them in meetings and talking to people that don't even live in our communities. Take that money and put it into the community, to the people that love those communities, the people that are working in them communities every day so that they can take care of themselves. Once they take care of themselves, then we'll take care of you. When you come to our community trying to get back over the bridge and don't have a way to go, come let stay at one of our churches, our congregation. Let us help you. This is what resiliency is all about. It's not about up here. 
It's about down here. And we try to keep it that way. So I want to shed a little insight on something that just transpired in the Bayview and why we think this is the right approach. So you saw the shipyard um, in that, those images, and, and unfortunately, the US Navy, back in the day, basically used its property as a hazmat site, basically. And a lot of people don't know that, but a lot of nuclear materials went through these shipyards. Um, some of them are still there or have been remediated. Uh, and the bottom line is, a lot of the people that were brought out to work in these shipyards were allowed to live in these neighborhoods after they shut down the shipyard. Little did they know that down the street when the dust blew, it was blowing all these materials up into their homes. And that's why we saw these high cancer rates and asthma rates and things that, frankly, people were complaining about. Well, now we know why. But let me explain to you why this program just went through a serious test. And I'm excited to say that we're still marching forward. The government has paid millions of dollars to clean up the shipyard millions of dollars, and hired a, um, a firm called Tetra Tech to test the soil to verify that it had successfully cleaned the soil so people could now move in the neighborhood and build housing. It was just revealed that that firm possibly falsified upwards of 90% of the soil samples that were taken. So think about this, though. If this was a top-down preparedness initiative going on in the Bayview, and the same people that said, we, you can trust us to clean up the mess we created, and we're gonna spend millions of dollars, and you can now live here safely. Imagine then when the news comes out about something like that, how many people would really wanna to continue to trust us to be the one that stewards their resilience after disaster? I know I wouldn't. And so I just wanna honor um, GL's leadership and a myriad of other folks, and Felicia Tibabo will be here well, because the bottom line is they're the face of resilience in that neighborhood. We support them, but when you come to our meetings and our events, they get up and lead the meetings, and they're the ones that do the presentations, right? And we simply are playing our position, which is support. And so I just want to offer that for those of you that do this work, because sometimes when you go into a neighborhood and you're trying to do your business, some other department drops the ball, well, guess what? You all get the same paycheck, your program goes sideways. These programs are frankly uh, uh, free of that because the community owns it, so they keep working, right? And so I just wanna give you some idea of why that, this approach is an insurance policy, because sometimes government, even though we have the best of intentions, we may not get it right, but the work can't stop. So this is a way to create that firewall around the work. Um, so with that, what's our investment strategy? And we were talking a little bit about this last night. So we work us on capacity, connection, and resources, right? We invest in all three of those. It's a good 401k, right? So the bottom line is, is that we work at all three of those levels at all times because you need all three of those levels in order to succeed during times of stress. We also focus on this model here, which is that we look, we first we focus on the individual, right? Let's make her as happy and healthy and connected as possible every day. Because happy, healthy, connected people do pretty well in disasters, don't they? Right? So that's our goal. But we realize that's not where the line, that's not the goal line. The goal line then, though, is to talk about, let's engage her immediate social network, her friends, her families, her neighbors, and say, do you know this person? Do you care about this person? Do you realize that she's in a, a wheelchair that runs on battery, but she lives in a third, three-story building? That battery is going to run out if the electricity turns off. Do you know how to carry someone like that out of a building? Or do you know how to provide them auxiliary support? In, in Hurricane Sandy, a friend of mine was in the lower Manhattan, and she was in an apartment building, and within hours of the power going off, she could hear people that were in their wheelchairs screaming for help because their batteries had died and they couldn't get around their unit, Right? So the bottom line is, is that the immediate social network we want to make sure is a, a connected to her resilience. Then where do they live? Is, the, is the, the apartment they live in going to support their mission as well, right? And this is something we're dealing right now with heat waves, is we're finding out in San Francisco that it's getting hotter every year. And guess what? None of our buildings have air conditioning in them that we live in, right? Because we built our housing for 1960 weather, not 2025 weather. And so we actually had a lethal heat wave last year for the first time ever, two days of over 100 degree temperatures. 
And we lost six residents, at least six residents in their homes because they didn't, um, weren't able to manage the heat. And the tragedy is not only did they die, but because of the impact of heat, and we can talk more about this another time, they lost their cognitive ability to call for help and none of them called 911, right? So again, if their social network isn't watching them and checking on them, they may not be able to defend themselves. So what's the outcome, right? So we wanna talk about getting the built environment caught up. We also wanna talk about the larger civic network and that's neighborhood associations and neighborhood groups that steward the community, but get them to look back and, and check on these folks. And then lastly, we wanna talk about our civic networks and the agencies and organizations that are set up to care for these folks as well. So what does that look like from a program standpoint? Well, we wanna go into neighborhoods and set up something called a hub. And a hub is a place-based network of community-serving organizations that work together every day on their individual resilience and their collective ability to respond to times of stress. Here's what a hub looks like um, pre-event. So in the center, you have an anchor institution. So in the city, we have anchor institutions such as the y Bayview YMCA. Um, we have Providence Baptist Church. We have, in every neighborhood, we actually identify a civic institution. In Mira Loma Park, it's the Mira Loma Park Improvement Club. So it doesn't have to be a building-based organization. It could be a social uh, civic network as well. The other agencies in that network come together, and they actually form the, the rest of the hub. And so those are the hub members. These are agencies that are committed to the mission of resilience, but maybe can't fulfill the anchor institution role. In the outer ring, then, we have what we call our, um, our block champion network, right? And this is a new program we're developing, which is about, at the block level, getting individuals to lean forward on the mission of preparedness. Now, the reason why you have a little people in here is because, as Dennis Maletti will say, you really only change your behavior after you're hearing the same information from three trusted sources. So if the pastor at a church in the Bayview tells the residents, you need to get ready, if the soccer coach or the basketball coach at the Baby YMCA tells the parents you need to get ready, right? And they see GL Hodge on the corner telling them to get ready, the science has shown there's an 80% chance that they'll be likely to get ready. Now, having the Baby YMCA at the table is amazing. Why? Because 3,600 people walk through their front door every week. Who's a better person to influence their behavior? Me, driving around the neighborhood with a bullhorn, or the staff of the YMCA? So that's why we need to onboard these agencies because pre-event, they could be our engine for preparedness. Now, post-event, this is what we want to do. We're going to activate something called a NEOC in the neighborhood, and we're training our organizations to participate, kind of like what you guys did today, and that is how they can come together and modify their mission but still continue to meet the needs of the neighborhood until the official big response agencies arrive, right? Meanwhile, out in the, in the block level, we now have our block champions opening up block support centers, and that's where Guido and John and I and Robert and Joni were sitting Monday night talking about the implementation plan when the earthquake struck. Um, and so the bottom line is we're really excited about this program, and we, we look forward to launching that um, downstream. Um, so that's basically the model as we look at it. Now, what happens is the first thing we do is we go into a neighborhood, and we asset map the neighborhood. So this is one of the tools we have called Map Your, Map Your Resilientville. And here, we look at the neighborhood through the lens of where are all these resources in the neighborhood and who owns them? And then we also say, who works with the vulnerable populations in this community? How can we partner with them to get them prepared for times of stress? So we take those actors and we then bring them into the table to talk about our program moving forward. We then run the annual tabletop exercise, which all of you participated in, because I don't know about you, but San Francisco's got a bit of a gentrification problem. And it's not only residents, but it's the leadership of our CBOs as well. And so what happens is you bring everyone together after a fire and five years in the past, and you're like, we're all on the same page now. Well, guess what? Over the last five years, 40% of those people no longer work in the community. So if you don't keep bringing those people together and, and convening them and letting the five new CBO members meet everyone else, then you probably aren't as ready as you think you are. And so that's one of the powers of that exercise. And so with that, right now, we have eight neighborhoods running this program. But what's exciting is we're onboarding four new neighborhoods. Um, this year, right now, the Western Edition uh, is one of the key neighborhoods we're focused on right now. And also what's exciting is 
we have actually two neighborhoods which has secured grants to bring this program in the neighborhood. So they're actually out fundraising to launch this program in their own community. And one of those is going to be the West Portal community, which has already practically written their plan. They haven't even got a nickel yet. So, uh, and I want to thank Joni Van Rin for helping them get up and running because the big lift they want to focus on is CERT and making sure they have a CERT team to help manage the uh, activity in their community. And Joni's providing technical support to them on that process as well. And again, how exciting to have Joni step into a leadership role in our neighborhood, and now three years later, she's volunteering and mentoring other neighborhoods to emulate what she's accomplished. How great is that? What's the budget hit on that, Bob? Zero, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I hope one day to be able to sit back and listen for a change and just fill this room up once a month and have all the Jonies and the Libbies and the Roberts come together and actually just drive this program and we can get out of the way. So I just want to thank all of them for their leadership on that. So we'll close on that. Thanks to our friends at USGS. We know where it will happen. We know who will be impacted. And we know who the first responders are going to be. And it's all of you. So let's get to work. Thank you very much, everyone.